Birds had always enjoyed a close relationship with Bob Dylan, so it came as no surprise when he suggested they do a version of his You Ain't Going Nowhere. I think coincidentally, we, you know, we'd just gone the same direction as he had. So when I heard You Ain't Going Nowhere, I thought that, that would be a perfect single, and we did it. And um, I messed the words up. I, I got them backwards, and I heard from him after that he wasn't happy about that. In fact, when he did it again, he, uh, he changed the words around on pick up your money and pack up your tent. And uh, I'd said pack up your money and pick up your tent. And so he went pick up your money and pack up your tent, McGuinn. <laughs> you ain't going nowhere. Get your mind off Twitter time. You ain't going nowhere. We were just out there searching and looking and not in necessarily, I don't mean we were going, let's try this and see if this works, or let's hoist this up the flagpole and see if they salute this. That wasn't it. It was just this love of the music. They enjoyed the ride for as long as it lasted, but frankly, it didn't sell. You know, they were just too early. Uh, the Sweetheart of the Rodeo was their worst selling album. I think that album influenced more musicians. It might have not have sold as much as the other birds album, but to the musicians coming along or kids wanting to pick up guitars, it really helped, uh, opened the doors for a lot of them. There's a lot of uh, influence there. Our doing country music did have an enormous effect on the pop field and later on the country field. Um, we were doing a combination of country and rock and uh, we had long hair, we grew our hair longer and we had beards and then a lot of other groups came along and followed us like, like the Eagles. And a few years after that, the uh, actual country singers, the young generation of country singers started growing their hair long and growing beards and, and playing identical music to what we had done in 68. As the birds rediscovered their country roots, one-time band member David Crosby was considering his options after his personal problems had proved too much for the rest of the group. By the end of my tenure in the birds, I had started using hard drugs already. And I was less than easy to deal with. Uh, so. It, <clears throat> I did not actually leave the birds willingly. The birds uh, came in the person of uh, Christopher and Roger and said, uh, uh, we'd like you out of the group. Uh, and I said, well, it's a shame, you know, we make good music. But if that's what you want, that's what you want. Okay. And uh, I said, don't you think, you know, that's kind of like foolish and, and Roger said those words with which he will have to live forever. We'll do better without you. <laughs> uh, I used to think about that a lot when we were starting Crosby, Stills and Nash. First thing that was interesting about Crosby, Stills and Nash was the name. Um, <laughs> it was very significant um, because it was more like the name of a law firm or an advertising agency than, than the name of a, of a band, you know. Well, well, you know, all the other bands of the period would call themselves sort of Iron Butterfly or Vanilla Fudge. <laughs> you know, here was uh, Crosby, Stills and Nash Incorporated, you know. Um, and it was a very, uh, it was a very um, significant name because it sort of said, you know, you, you will acknowledge that this is a super group, that, you know, that, that, that these three guys have past they each have their own sort of cv that they've brought to this new merger when i got tossed out of the birds i hit a very uh fruitful period of songs when it is So when I encountered Stephen and Graham, uh, I had uh, grown considerably as a writer. 
And they gave me the freedom, the belief, the support, you know, to do that. In the morning after it rained. Peacocks wandered aimlessly underneath an orange tree. Why can't she see me? I loved the first album. Uh, there's a lot of personal attachment to it because uh, I was able to, to go to uh, the Wally Heider, Heider Studios in Los Angeles when they were putting it together. And all of those songs are classics and, and, and many of them have stood the test of time. It's been a long time coming. What you heard on that record was what naturally happened when the three of us sat down and sang a song to each other. The first song that we ever sang together was uh, uh, In the Morning When You Rise. In the morning when you rise. Uh, still sang it to me. I'm in a harmony. We sang that for him. Graham, he said, do that again. We said, OK. He said, we finished it. He said, do it one more time. And we did it again. He said, OK, now do it one more time. And the third time. It sounded like that. It reminded people of the beauty of melody and harmony. It reminded us of what we had learned from the Leuven brothers and from the Everly brothers and, and uh, from the mamas and the papas and just anybody who, who sings high harmonies and does it well. Whenever I think of that album, I think of Crosby, Stills, and Nash in Laurel Canyon while on tour. You know, they would just repair to some friend's house, and then they would just break into song. Just the joy of singing was what they were about at the time. And those soaring harmonies had an effect on the most unlikely people. It was fun to hang out with those guys because they would break into these days, sing this stuff, it sounded so good, you know? And he'd say, hey, we could probably do that. We could probably do something kind of like that, you know? We could sing harmony too, hell, you know? <laughs> and I mean, we, you know, we don't have those kind of voices, but we could at least, we could hit the notes. Epic pieces like Dark Star, which were more jam sessions than songs, the Grateful Dead had taken acid rock to the limit. Having spent thousands of dollars trying to capture the excitement of their live shows on record, they were now badly in debt to Warner Brothers. It was time to come up with a new plan. Recalling their early days in bluegrass bands, Robert Hunter and Jerry Garcia knuckled down to write some real songs. Well, the first days are the hardest days, don't you worry anymore. Cause when life looks like easy street, there is danger at your door. Think this through with me. Part of it was expedience, uh, part of it was we we spent so much time in the studio with our first uh, with our second two records uh and spent so much money that there was no chance of ever making any money from the sales of the record so we thought well this is not gonna this is we need to be able to make a record quickly you know or at least in less than a year <laughs> i talked to the guy said hey guys uh, why don't we approach this one as though it were like a country and western record uh, or like California country and western, you know, like Bakersfield type, something like that. So that's lean, lean and sort of lean and mean and do things that are, reflect 
a, a kind of a, a basic approach to playing and to accompanying the songs. Which is exactly what they did. In the space of a year producing two acclaimed acoustic-based albums, Working Man's Dead and American Beauty. It was really fun to write for that album. Uh, Hunter and I were living together in the same house. Jerry always had such a cool approach to guitar. I was, all, I was pretty slam bang in those days. And uh, so you could hear me good. I'd be up there saying, and he'd be down there with that same theme, John, you know. You know, just being as cool. And I'd hand this thing, and uh, it was, it was, uh, it was like telepathy, but I think it had to do with actual vibes of thumping on the roof and everything like that. Actual vibes as opposed to uh, metaphysical vibes. For the Grateful Dead's principal writers, it was an incredibly fruitful phase, and songs tumbled out in quick succession. Ripple, one of the most enduring, was written almost spontaneously on a visit to London. I never have been able to plan what I'm going to write. Somebody asked me to write a certain kind of song with the best will in the world. I can only write the phrases that, that form in my head. And uh, so uh, I don't fight that, never have. Just let what comes into my head hit the paper. And, uh, and I've had enough validation of this that it's become a very strong trait with me. I have confidence in what I write. <laughs> my first trip to England and uh, I was on the number 10 Devonshire Terrace left to myself with a case of red Cena and some sun shining through the window now, I hadn't drunk the red Cena yet I don't know if I needed to uh, and just looking out on the street there uh, if my words did glow with the gold of sunshine And my tunes were played On the harp on the strong Would you hear my voice Come through the music Would you hold me As it were your own it came out, it came out perfect. It came out in gold. It was, uh, I was conscious when I was writing it that, uh, mm, well, I, I, I have to speak in metaphors that, that there was gold dripping out of the pen. Let there be songs to fill the air. It was fantastic. I still remember when they brought the tapes to Rolling Stone. They came to our office in San Francisco. Uh, these big old 12-inch reels, whatever they were. And um, ran into Jan Winner's office, our editor's office, and lit up a couple of joints and rolled the tapes. And we could not believe it, because we had all heard them on flatbed trucks in, in the Haight-Ashbury and in the park. and you know, noodling endlessly on the stage of the Fillmore or wherever they happen to be and doing the uh, uh, Trips Festival and the acid tests and all that kind of stuff. And this was like you know, the flip side completely. And it just sounded beautiful. It was just beautiful. You just had to say, okay, forget all we have known about the Grateful Dead. They are now at another stage, another, perhaps a phase, but a beautiful phase it was. As rock's innovators returned to the roots of American music, they opened the door for a new kind of artist. I'm going to say another, uh, another new one now. The once marginalized folkies were to re-emerge as singer-songwriters. Neil Young really um, sort of put himself on, on the map as, as one of the leading solo figures, one of the kind of great lone wolves, if you like, of that period. Here it is. This one's in G, if anybody wants it. 